Hello, I'm Graham Peck, author of Making an Anti-Slavery Nation, Lincoln, Douglas, and the Battle Over Freedom. And you're watching Author's Voice. Welcome to Author's Voice, where we bring you authors uh, from around the country and the world, really. Uh, so we're, we appreciate your coming to be with us again. You're on House Divided, which is our show on Lincoln, the Civil War, uh, 19th century, and U.S. presidents. Uh, so this is going to be one of those shows today. We appreciate your being with us. Since you're live and watching, if you'd like to leave a question, please do. Uh, you'll see below the screen that you're watching a button that says questions and press that and ask us a question. We'll try to get it on while we're live. At the same time, if you'd like to get a book signed, a first edition, uh, I think you're going to enjoy this book. It's an interesting book that will get into uh, one little area of our history greatly and in, in depth. Uh, one that you may think you know a great deal about, but I think you're going to learn some integration of society and culture as well as politics and war. So if you're watching on YouTube afterward and seeing it on our archive, I hope you'll uh, watch the whole thing. And if you'd like a signed book, most likely we'll still have signed first editions available for you. But this is a time of year when books get out of here fairly quickly as gifts for yourself or for others. So uh, be prepared and do it early if you can. Well, we're very happy to have a local uh, historian here today, Graham Peck, a professor of history at St. Xavier University in Chicago. He's a writer, director, and producer of Stephen Douglas and the Fate of American Democracy, which was an award-winning documentary that was on uh, PBS, certainly here in Chicago, elsewhere as well. I just in Chicago. Just in Chicago. Well, I think you can also watch it. I uh, think that you have a podcast uh, that you can go to called CivilWarProf.com. And you might be able to see that documentary on that as well, I believe. Well, Graham's latest book is right here, Making an Anti-Slavery Nation, Lincoln, Douglas, and the Battle Over Freedom. University of Illinois Press is 264 pages as eight interesting maps, and it's $34.95. Now, what Graham is doing here is tracing this conflict of slavery, mainly here in Illinois. And uh, we were a crux. We were right in the middle of everything, even though we were in a Western state, uh, seeing that every political and cultural stripe went through Illinois. If you remember, here in Chicago, we're in the northern part, but Cairo, the southern part, is further south than Cairo. Than, than Richmond, forgive me. And the middle of, middle of central area where Lincoln especially was, and Douglas as well, uh, was, had all sorts of political stripes that they each learned a great deal, especially Lincoln. He's the one who grew uh, in that area. So let's get to a couple of things. Uh, first of all, why did you do this book and why now? Well, I was very interested in trying to understand how the political crisis over slavery, which emerges in the 1850s, was rooted in the nation's earlier past, and especially in its founding period. And characteristically, historians have understood the political crisis of the 1850s in a very narrower uh, time period, really starting with the war with Mexico. So the mid-1840s, you see the emergence of what was called sectional politics, the Compromise of 1850 to contain that you know, that immediate crisis over whether slavery would move into the western lands acquired from Mexico. And then, of course, the emergence of the Republican Party later uh, in the 1850s, which would eventuate in Lincoln's election. And from my perspective, there was a broader story of a, of a conflict between slavery and freedom that you could trace back to the founding era. And historians were aware of that, obviously, right? There's, there's influential books on the 
on the Missouri crisis. There's an important new work that's been done in the early republic in the last few decades. And historians have long been interested in, in the role of slavery during the uh, 1830s and 1840s. So it wasn't as if no historians had ever paid attention to this question, but it's not also the case that you can find a book that tries to actually tell through a narrative beginning in the founding uh, era, through Lincoln's election, that story is a unified whole and tracing the connections between society, economics, and politics, uh, and between both political parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, and those parties that preceded them, all in one synthetic narrative. So yeah. that's really what I was trying to do. And you've done very well, because uh, this is something I think can be a primer for many people on how the Civil War, how do we come to the Civil War? And the, of course, the, those in the day thought that the revolution through the Civil War had parentheses around them. That was an era. And when Lincoln was killed, Washington and Lincoln, were their images were put together innumerable times. So they understood this. Now, I'm first going to ask you, uh, because I was, reading the book, I was reminded of a class that I had when I was in uh, graduate school, actually, that... Uh, asked us to rank the various, what were the causes of the Civil War? Well, you know, we're, in a way, we're still asking that, I guess. I think that man in the White House was wondering uh, why we couldn't compromise uh, the Civil War. Well, we had compromised the Civil War since the beginning, and that's one of the narratives of this book. So I was asked, rank the following, uh, union, slavery, political power, economic power, anything else. Um, Certainly, Abner Doubleday, he said in an in a 1861 letter, it's, anyone who thinks this is not about slavery is wrong. Lincoln said the same thing, and I'll, uh, we can talk about that as well. Uh, but you're going to say that really slavery was the overpowering. What would you say right after that, since we're going to talk about slavery being the real driver of the Civil War? What would you say came after that? Economics, power, union? I think the way I would answer that question is to say that slavery was integrated pervasively into almost all aspects of American life. And what the book does is try to show how that pervasive conflict that slavery produced with freedom would play out over 70 years. So it's not that there's any one of those things that's more important per se, rather I'm trying to get come to grips with the, the nature of the conflict itself, which was fundamental and woven into American political culture, uh, woven into American political structures, woven into American economic uh, behaviors, and, and that's really the kind of thing that the book uh, does. Let me ask you also as a general question before we get into the substance of this. Uh, in a footnote, number 12 to be exact in the introduction, uh, you say that Michael Holt, uh, who's an historian, stresses contingency as a critical aspect of the origin of civil war. You say that you use the same approach, but with slavery as a central cause. Will you explain this to us, please? Sure. So Michael Holt is a very distinguished historian. He's written a series of major works on the origin of the civil war particularly. And his work greatly influenced me, uh, I, especially because, as I mentioned, I was interested in trying to root the origins of the Civil War in this longer time span. But Michael Holt was one of these historians whose focus on contingency, that is to say, specific moments in time where a particular decision, usually by an individual, uh, precipitates a sort of a forking effect where history can go in a different path depending on the decision that's made. And I don't think any professional historian would deny the influence of, of contingency in, in historical trajectories, and, and I certainly would not. But there's always this tension with trying to marry contingent explanations with structural ones. You know, broad forces in history that, that aren't shaped by any one decision. That in fact, the decisions that are made are in the context of these broad structures and whoever you put in a, in a particular place to make a decision are, is still gonna be making a decision within that context. So Holt's work and, and scholars like him who emphasize that tend to look at specific moments, say for instance the election of President Polk, and say, oh, if only he hadn't been elected and Henry Clay had been elected instead. 
then the crisis over Mexico wouldn't have occurred. We could have avoided war, and the history of the country could have you know, been very different. We could have averted this crisis over slavery and this, this, this massive crisis that we call the Civil War. And so that, I think, those are significant explanations, and historians have to take those quite seriously. And, and he has put out a challenge in his work, I think, in his, in his career, to, to other historians to try and explain the origins of the Civil War while acknowledging the significance of contingency. And so that's what I was trying to do, and maybe a comparison of my book to another very distinguished work on the origins of the Civil War would be Eric Foner's Free Soil, Free Labor, Free Men, uh, a, a tremendous book. I have great admiration for it. A, a, and yet it's different from my book in the sense that it focuses on the four to six years before the Civil War breaks out. It's focused just on one party, the Republican Party, and heavily interested in ideology, which I am as well. But because of this particular focus, it's not an attempt to explain over time precisely how ideas about slavery bring people into dispute. It presumes certain kinds of things that the Republican ideology could explain conflict with the democratic ideology that's not discussed in the book. That's the kind of explanation that Michael Holt didn't like because he says that's not how history happens to people. History follows certain decisions and forking moments and then later people have to work within the, the structures that were created after that forking moment. So that, that's really the best way to describe what my book is trying to do. It's engaging with Holt in, in, you know, in the way that he says you know, history should be done, and, and, and the way that he does do history in a very distinguished manner. Now, as I said before, we're using, you use, Illinois as an exemplar of the nation, maybe because we had Lincoln and Douglas here, and uh, the nation focused on that. Certainly when it got to the debates, they focused on it, and that's what propelled Lincoln to the presidency as well. So you write, Illinois is a unique window into the interactability of the conflict between slavery and freedom. So tell us how Illinois is that exemplar. All right, so Illinois is Briefly. very useful, I think, to understanding the conflict between slavery and freedom for three big reasons. So the big, biggest reason of all is that by the 1850s, the two most important northern politicians are in Illinois. Stephen A. Douglas is the most significant northern democratic politician. He's probably the only senator in the history of the country to out shine three consecutive presidents. And Abraham Lincoln is the Republican politician who forges the party, more than any other single individual, forges the Republican Party in Illinois. And then by 1860, manages to disseminate his ideas about anti-slavery reform to the rest of the nation, and manages to utilize his ideas to rise to the uh, leadership of the party and, and the ideas that are articulated in 1860 bring, bring the entire North to the Republican standard. So, so that's very significant. How was it that this state produced these two individuals? And the book makes a major effort to, to explain that. The second reason Illinois is very important is that there was a huge controversy over slavery in Illinois shortly after it became a state in 1818. The reason there was an enormous controversy over slavery in Illinois was because there was slavery in Illinois, because the first settlers were predominantly Southerners, and the wealthy Southerners who migrated to Illinois had slaves because that's what wealthy Southerners did. They owned slaves so that they had domestic help in their houses and so that they had uh, laborers to produce surpluses that they could sell for profit. So those people who migrated north across the Ohio River were going to bring their slaves with them. However, because the Northwest Ordinance precluded slavery in the Northwest Territories, which included Illinois, they had to use a system of indentured servitude to make it legal. When they came into the state in 1818, there was some desire for those slave-owning politicians who had disproportionate political influence to make slavery legal, but they feared they would not be admitted to the state by Congress if they wrote a constitution that was pro-slavery. We don't know the precise reasons that the Illinois Constitution was written as it did because we have very skeletal records of that debate. But it's likely that we would have had slavery except for the Northwest Ordinance, making them fearful that they wouldn't be admitted as a state. However, soon after being admitted as a, as a state, the pro-slavery forces tried to change the Constitution to legalize slavery directly. That effort was defeated, but only after a massive massive political conflagration in which the anti-slavery forces mobilized to preserve freedom. 
So we see this national debate over slavery take shape in the state of Illinois, and many of the arguments that would later be used by Lincoln and by Douglas are there uh, in, in a, a sort of a embryo. And that, I think, is very important to help understanding the conflict over slavery, not only as a conflict between the North and South, but between Northerners. Did, did Seward and Chase and Blair and Cameron, did they see the centrality at the time of Illinois, or were they focused on themselves more until the Democrats, uh, Republicans came here at the wigwam and Lincoln forced himself in and took over? I think that's a great question. So I am not arguing that in the 1820s, Illinois was of central significance to shaping the fate of the nation. That wouldn't be true. It was very important in the 1820s uh, for Illinoisans to choose slavery or freedom to shape their future. And that's why they got very excited, because they were concerned with what their future would be in this state. But from the purposes of a historian explaining the significance of slavery to northern politics, Illinois is very valuable to me, and I think to any readers of this book, to understand the nature of this conflict and, and how it was rooted very deeply in the, in, in the country's political ideas and political culture. So the question you ask is, when was Illinois so significant to people at the time? And I think that really is the 1850s, because at that juncture, you have a much larger state, many more people in it. You've, you've had a, a far greater movement of people west. And west and north. And, and north. And so, so suddenly there is, in the nation at large, a conversation about what the future of the West is going to be. And it's a very, very uh, charged discussion because territories can either be free or slave. So then the, the nation has this tension over what it will be from its inception. But when you take that tension to any given territory, one idea has to prevail. And, and that's, that's of crucial importance because if you're a slaveholder and you, and you know how to make money by utilizing slave labor, then naturally you wish to carry on that practice wherever you go. If you're a small freeholding farmer, and that's how you know how to make money, and you're afraid that you cannot take that practice into a territory where large slaveholders are going to predominate, they're going to control politics, they're going to pass laws that force you to function very differently, then you don't want that future. So that the territories were critical, and they were critical to Illinoisans, particularly because the next generation of Illinoisans was moving west. The children of many Illinoisans were going to be uh, you know, across the Mississippi River. So uh, by the 1850s, Illinois was important because it had these leading politicians and because it had a generation of Americans who were going to move west and wanted those territories to be free. Uh, I have about five questions I'd like to ask all at once. If we were just schizophrenic enough, we could ask them all at once. But um, one is, let's take Douglas. Uh, of course, 1854 was a critical moment for the nation. And Douglas was trying to come up with some, something to keep the country together. We could have, as you know, could have been apart in the 20s and, and numbers of times after that. And we had various compromises. Why don't you, before we get to Douglas, give us a truly brief idea of what those compromises were. The Constitution began that. Okay, so at the Constitutional Convention, the founders were essentially nationalists who were trying to find a way of creating a constitutional fabric that would unite the country because they feared that the small little states on the Atlantic seaboard were very vulnerable to the pressures from great European powers. So they wanted to unify this country uh, with a durable constitution that would integrate people's uh, values and interests. But to do that, they had to resolve a number of issues, one of which was this problem over slavery. If they separated their interests on slavery and they pitted themselves against each other, this nation could implode. So from the inception, there had to be compromises, especially by Northerners, to tolerate a social system that the revolutionary ideals said was wrong. For the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part, Southerners accepted that slavery was wrong, but said, we can't get rid of it. It's too deeply woven into our social structures, into our cultural practices, into the ways that we make money. You, you can't strip that from us, and the Northerners accepted that deal. 
I'm just going to intervene here. Did they really feel that it was wrong? Did the majority of the South believe slavery was wrong? I mean, religion was helping them out down there, was it not? And their whole structure of society proved to them that these races were like this. Well, that's a, that's a great question, and the historians might certainly disagree on that answer. I think I would say this, that conceptually, the revolutionary ideal made clear that slavery violated human rights. I think on that basis, most people would have said it was wrong. Not everybody, certainly. Uh, and what you see over the course of the next 50 years was a transformation in those Southern attitudes. When John C. Calhoun, in the late 1830s, says on the floor of Congress that slavery is a positive good, that it's a positive blessing, it shocks the members of Congress who are listening to this and are amazed that he will say this. And there's consternation. And there's even Southerners who say, this shouldn't be said. This isn't correct. This isn't right. Within 15 years, that Southern orthodoxy, there's a whole proliferation of pro-slavery uh, ideals, pro-slavery biblical arguments, pro-slavery economic arguments, pro-slavery political arguments. And that's certainly the basis of the pro-slavery constitutionalism that's articulated by the Confederate nation. So I think there is a change. That doesn't mean, though, that people uh, you know, in the late 1780s were ready to get rid of slavery. Right? Articulating an ideal is very different than saying we're going to realize that ideal immediately. And partly, of course, the dissonance between the ideal and the practice is what gave such animation to the political debates between Lincoln and Douglas and between the Southerners, because they all declared their allegiance to the founders, and all of them had a rationale by which they could claim a historical trajectory. Now, the Democrats in particular, you say, divorced anti-slavery sentiment from anti-slavery politics. And they had to, because how could they say that we believe in anti-slavery reform, but under no circumstances we will do it? Uh, that's a difficult thing to say, so it's better not to talk about it. That was their preferred system. So I'm not saying that none of them were anti-slavery. I am saying that they needed to tolerate slavery because they were allied with Southern Democrats who were unapologetically pro-slavery, and they blow up their party if they started talking like abolitionists saying slavery is wrong and we need to fix it. Because then how can you compromise? You start putting yourself in ideological positions that are very difficult to diplomatically maneuver through. So you have a uh, chapter on Douglas's dilemma. And certainly, as I said, in 54, 1854, Lincoln rose up. And uh, maybe we should talk about his Peoria speech. Again, we're putting off Douglas a little bit here because this is the Abraham Lincoln bookshop and not the Stephen A. Douglas bookshop. So <laughs> he's going to have to wait. And so in 54, uh, he saw slavery getting in, perhaps going into the territories. And to me, that's the most important aspect of, of Lincoln and what he did. I've said before, uh, before this that Union was nice. He kept Union. He, he helped abolish slavery. But I think the most important thing he did was stop the uh, nationalization of slavery into the territories. And that was his red line, and he wouldn't let anything cross it, even if war came. We'll get to that. But so he had his Peoria speech. Uh, Matt, we have, uh, here he is in two years later in, uh, in the lost speech in Bloomington. Uh, that was lost because he became Lincoln so fiery over the issues. Everyone dropped their pencils and pens, except for Billy Herndon, and, uh, who took her notes. But was he as powerful in Peoria when he came out to try to stop this nationalization and bringing his own ideation into uh, American politics? I think so. I think the Peoria Address marks a transformation in Lincoln. I'm certainly not the first historian to make this case. Many historians believe this. Not, not all. So if you look at someone like Robert uh, jo Johansson, he believed that, that Lincoln changes over time. I, I really do not uh, agree with that assessment. So I, I think that you're absolutely right. Lincoln sees the Kansas-Nebraska Act sponsored by Douglas as a fundamental change in American politics because it puts slavery and freedom on an equal moral ground from the standpoint of national policy. And Lincoln says, whoa, we now see this transformation towards a more positive attitudes towards slavery in this country. And we, we have to say no. We have to stop that. 
So he doesn't take an abolitionist position and say, we're trying to abolish slavery in the states where it currently exists now. He doesn't say that. But he does say we have to go back to the founder's policy articulated in the Northwest Ordinance where slavery will not be permitted to expand so that it will eventually die. So it, there is this sort of extended abolitionism where we're projecting an eventual death of slavery. We're not going to kind of do anything to kill it ourselves. We think it will die by itself if we stop it from, ex from expanding. Well, he was a conservative guy. He's not sure that he could do that even if he was emperor, That's that he could correct. really do that. So uh, he was hewing toward the Constitution. That's correct. He knew it was bad policy and immoral, but he just felt he couldn't do that. So if he could stop it from growing, That's and correct. the Southerners knew that, when they couldn't get Cuba as a state because the power would have shifted in the Senate and Congress if they had, and uh, if it wasn't going to go to the territories that we had grabbed from Mexico, then they were going to be on that vine and that's as far as they're going to go, and they felt it too, I think, and maybe war came. Since we're on uh, abolitionists, um, we got a question from Jared in Tulsa. Thank you, Jared, for this. And, uh, you know, because he wasn't an abolitionist, and uh, I'm wondering how abolitionist thought evolved over time, especially maybe here in Illinois, but uh, Jared is asking, what's the difference between abolition and anti-slavery positions. Did Illinois have parties for each point of view? Yes, okay, so they definitely did have parties for different points of view. And I think the most useful way of thinking about this is to realize that there is no one fixed abolitionist position. The abolitionists dis disagreed to, to an extent among themselves. And there was a wide range of anti-slavery positions, so much so that many people would even argue today that Douglas was anti-slavery. I, I do not argue that. I argue that he should be considered pro-slavery, but that gives you a sense of the difficulty in trying to pin down the meanings of this word. Years ago, I wrote an article in the Journal of the Abraham Lincoln Association that actually interrogated the meanings of anti-slavery and pro-slavery. So, so I would encourage Jared to go read that article uh, because it, 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 it articulates this perspective that we should think about these terms on a continuum. And, and, and in other words, not as fixed positions, but where lots of people could align themselves. So if we, one way to think about abolitionism, though, is, is in this way, that the abolitionists desired slavery's death, including in the southern states. And theoretically, the southern states, under the Constitution, had complete power to control their own domestic policy. So northern states should have no business telling them whether or not to abolish their slaves. So that's one way to think about abolitionism that, in general, is different than anti-slavery, which we could describe as a position that says slavery is wrong. Now, that doesn't mean there's any prescribed policy of what we do with it being wrong. So you could, we have this range of possibilities. So Lincoln would be in this position where he says slavery is wrong, and he thought for almost all his life, according to the best documentation we have, that it was wrong. That didn't mean that throughout his life he took the same position towards slavery. In 1854, he takes this very major step of deciding that a political position to prevent slavery's expansion was imperative so that the nation could maintain an anti-slavery character to preserve what he considered the fundamental doctrine of freedom. Uh, that helped ally him with abolitionists who were hoping to get national policy behind anti-slavery reform. And ultimately, what would happen in the 1850s is the Republican Party would bring together more moderate anti-slavery folks with these more extreme anti-slavery folks, which we would call abolitionists, where they would combine to say, what policy can unite us that the moderate folks thinks is, think is constitutional and, and, and is not justification for disunion, doesn't violate the agreements of the Constitution, is, is, is no basis for, uh, for justifying Southerners to leave the Union, which they've been threatening to do for, for, for forever, pretty much. And literally, since the Constitutional Convention, we won't join you unless you make compromises over no slavery. Which goes way back. Exactly. So, so that's, that's what happens. These two wings kind of come together for the first time because there always had been suspicion among just the anti-slavery variant of Americans, uh, and particularly Northerners, suspicion against the abolitionists because they're not truly American. They're violating the compact of the Constitution. There's this document that makes possible the fabric of freedom because we must have order. We can't have freedom without order. 
because freedom without order will turn to anarchy. The founders have been worried about this. And one of the, one of the characteristics of order is that we'll follow the agreement. And the agreement is that, that we, we can see what the agreement is. We, we've got it down. We, we, we admire and venerate our Constitution. And those folks, those abolitionists, they're very dangerous because they are trying to rip it up. And so, so that is a way of helping to dis disentangle these different concepts of anti-slavery. Didn't matter to the South. They looked north. And they saw abolitionism starting from the most moderate anti-slavery guy there could be through Lincoln to abolitionism, all the same thing. And they knew, they felt, that if Lincoln was elected, which he was, that they had no slavery in the future, even though they felt that it, maybe it's not going to come immediately. Well, maybe they did think it was going to come immediately. They were ready for war, and, uh, and the war came. So what was that dilemma that Douglas had if he really didn't feel that slavery was a moral wrong, which I kind of see in him? Uh, what was the dilemma he had in the 50s then besides Lincoln harping on him? Great question. So Most of my questions are. So perhaps as a leaping off point from what you said, it's not just that the Southerners thought Lincoln was an abolitionist. They thought Douglas, for all practical purposes, was as well. The Democratic Party shatters because Southern Democrats repudiate Stephen A. Douglas and his preferred policy towards slavery by the later 1850s, which was a policy called popular sovereignty by which settlers in a American territories could decide whether to legalize slavery or not. To Douglas, this policy solved the national problem between slavery and freedom that existed since the founding. It allowed the nation to continue to expand. No problem. Acquire any territory we can. And he was a huge nationalist, advocated continental acquisition. He wanted us to, to stretch from sea to, 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 to shining sea and to move into the Pacific Ocean. So, so he wanted the territories, and if you want the territories and you want the country to expand, you have to be able to adjudicate this nasty problem between slavery and freedom. So his idea to Lincoln was potentially pro-slavery by taking away any distinction between slavery and freedom, any moral distinction. To Southerners, though, they look at it and say, no, 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 this is a nasty northern anti-slavery trick by which you're allowing Northerners to sneak into these territories and vote down slavery and, and get your way through so-called democratic procedures, just like the abolitionists would by getting Congress to, to prohibit slavery in those territories. They don't trust it, which is partly why there's still historians to this day that think Douglas was anti-slavery, because if they believe what the Southerners believe, that he just never admitted he was anti-slavery, that this was a, a secret anti-slavery trick. So, 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 so that explanation of his dilemma tells us his problem. He was stuck between the North and the South. He didn't want disunion. He loved the country. He was a tremendous patriot, no question. But he was not as adverse to slavery as most Northerners who very clearly were willing to say it was a moral wrong. And, and, and we, we can never point to anything that he said to very clearly indicate that he thought it was a moral He was wrong. ready to kick it down the road again. We, we, there's, there's statements he made that indirectly suggest it was a moral wrong. They tended to be made in the 1840s, in 1850, and those kind of comments sort of pass by the wayside as the decade goes on, and instead you start getting comments that are more and more tolerant of slavery and its expansion. And I wrote in, in this article I wrote in Douglas some years ago, it's hard to know what he actually thought because in all of these cases he was functioning as a politician in a political context where he was trying to negotiate between the North and the South. Uh, what, we, what we do know is that over time he's taking positions that are increasingly pro-slavery in, in my, at least in my judgment of what he says and the kind of concessions he's willing to make to Southerners to save the Union. And Lincoln was pushing him that way as yes. well, by the way. And uh, I'm just going to read a little bit of a letter that Lincoln wrote. Now, this is back in, this is in 55 now, uh, August 55, to a guy named George Robertson, who was a judge in Lexington, Kentucky, and done some work for the Lincoln family in, an, in a dispute over 
property over from the heirs uh, of the Todd family. But he wrote here, and this is the only time he ever did this, in a private letter, he did not come out and say this, which is kind of interesting, I think. Uh, maybe he was very fearful to be put into that abolitionist mode. I think we have a photograph of him uh, in this time period, 54, Matt, there we go, from uh, Von Schneidau here in Chicago, holding an abolitionist paper, by the way, which was uh, no one would have known because it was solarized out. Uh, you wouldn't have seen it. Um, but that's what the animal looked like at this time. And he wrote to Robertson, you are not a friend of slavery in the abstract. And that speech you spoke of, because he, he gave him a book. He came to Springfield, Lincoln wasn't there, he gave him a book and wrote a letter and Lincoln wrote, uh, wrote back about that book. Um, in that speech you spoke of the peaceful extinction of slavery and used other expressions indicating your belief that the thing was at some time to have an end. Since then we have had 36 years of experience what you're talking about in this book. And this experience has demonstrated, I think, that there is no peaceful extinction of slavery in prospect for us. The signal failure of Henry Clay, whom he loved, and other good and great men in 1849 to effect anything in favor of gradual emancipation in Kentucky, together with a thousand other signs, extinguishes that hope utterly. And he said that it was, it was only war that was going to distinguish, extinguish slavery. The spirit which desired the peaceful extinction of slavery has itself become extinct with the occasion and the men of the revolution. He goes on and says that the autocrat of the Russians will reign his, will resign his crown and proclaim his subjects free Republicans sooner than will our American masters voluntarily give up their slaves. Our political problem now is, can we as a nation continue together permanently, forever, half slave and half free? That's pretty powerful stuff. That didn't really get out in that form that he was going to, he would let war come. And when it did, he was ready for it because he couldn't go over the red line of nationalization. Yeah, I think he faced a tremendous dilemma himself which would be evident after Douglas faced his dilemma. And that dilemma, as you suggest, would be once the Southerners secede, what do you do? Or when they threaten secession, you know, what do you do? And we must remember that the Republican Party could probably never have come to power if Republican politicians like Lincoln had said, oh yes, if you elect us, the South is going to secede. And then we're going to be embroiled in a massive civil war to destroy slavery. So yeah, go ahead and elect us. That's, that'll be a great future. Well, if they didn't say that, they never would have got elected because, of course, Stephen A. Douglas and the Democrats were saying precisely that thing. You elect those Republicans, and this is going to end very badly. The Southerners will not accept this. The land will be deluged in blood. Don't do it. They're fanatics. You know, the, the Democrats used the language that had been applied to abolitionists for years to paint the Republicans with those same colors. So the Republicans had really no option except to deny it, to say that won't happen. There will be a peaceful adjudication. Southerners will, will be cranky, but they'll get over it. We're not going to do anything wild and crazy. We're simply going to follow constitutional norms. Slavery will slowly die because we're going to circumscribe its expansion, and all will be good. And then a month later, after Lincoln's election, all was not so good. And, and yet at that point, as is always the case for politicians, it's hard to turn back. And Lincoln chose not to turn back. He said, we cannot permit slavery's expansion. We've created this huge political party. It's been difficult to do. If we permit slavery's expansion and betray everything that we've told the voters that we will do, then we will just bring this problem back into American society and this work will have to be redone down the road. So we have to hold to our position now and, and of course he was a regular human being. He couldn't know the future. He himself did not know just how high the price would be and his second inaugural gives us some sense of a man years later who's had to really grapple personally with the costs of not only the nation's a dilemma, 
but with his own political role in taking the nation to that place? Well, I think he affected change. He, he was modest about that, saying events controlled me. But I think he affected change quite a bit for his own personality and how he decided to keep going over on this road till it ended now, one way or the other. Uh, I'd like to go back to Illinois because we didn't go into this a little bit. I want to show some of the maps okay. that you show in there. And again, we're, we're getting out of time a bit here, but I want to show the, our viewers uh, some of the maps that are going on. So let's take them in order very briefly, tell us what we're seeing. Here is an 1848 map, uh, and uh, Lincoln was uh, in Congress at that time, and uh, we have a picture of him too, but I want to show the map. What are we seeing here, and how will, it, how will it relate to the next map? Okay, so this is the combined vote for president, the presidential election in 1848, combined vote of the Whig and Free Soul parties. And let's recall that the Free Soul Party was an anti-slavery extension party that emerges in 1848 throughout the North, gets around 15% of the Northern vote, a little bit less in Illinois, but that was quite a bit of the vote because there had been only a very short duration of time that the party emerges, can try and organize, and then collect votes. So, so I combined the Free Soul and Whig votes because the Northern Whigs also said we support the limitation on slavery's extension. We are an advocate of the Wilmot Proviso by which slavery shouldn't go into Mexican territories, which had yet to be resolved in 1848. And if we combine their vote, we see a map that's going to look very similar to a map in 1856. If you combine the Republican vote plus the American Party vote in 1856, the American Party was his nativist party, and we've just popped it up, so thank you very much. So if we take a look at this map, it's really quite similar. And now we've got to remember, of course, Illinois' population is expanding very rapidly in the 1850s. It's a very dynamic time. So this is not the exact same electorate, but there is still this tripartite division between the state where the northern third of the state is intensely anti-slavery for the most part. The southern third tends to be very strongly democratic, and the middle third is in dispute where there's both uh, migrant streams that have been from the north and from the south, they're mixing. And so the, the, the middle portion of the state, as historians have long known, uh, is in a sense the critical region that is going to determine the state's overall, uh, overall decision. And Lincoln and Douglas are fighting over the middle of the state from 1856 to 1860. And if we look at a map from 1860, we have that as well. We would, we would also see that there's a similar breakdown in the vote. Uh, we get, a, 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 by that point, a little more intensive anti-slavery uh, turnout in the northern states, more intensive uh, democratic turnout in the, uh, sorry, not northern states, in the northern counties of the state, and more intensive democratic turnout in the southern counties, but still it's quite similar. So I thought it was important to sh use those maps to, to give a sense of how the politics of the 1850s can be discerned quite a bit earlier in the 1840s. Whenever this issue got put on the table, you'd start seeing uh, the dispositions of Illinoisans in how they perceived the slavery issue. Well, certainly someone perceived it, and uh, Elijah Lovejoy, and we have an image of what happened to him and his press. Uh, for, he was first in Missouri and then now in, in Illinois. So give us a very brief uh, uh, image of what Lovejoy's role was and how did that change Illinois politics, if it did? Briefly, please. We're almost at the end. Lovejoy was this very um, kind of characteristic abolitionist, if you will. Someone who was so passionate about the abolition issue that he was willing to speak fearlessly about it. And it was dangerous to be an abolitionist in the 1830s and 1840s because they were considered fanatics and people who threatened the Union. So I'm very unpatriotic, and to save the Union, we need to shut you up. And so he tries to uh, articulate abolitionist viewpoints, talks about how slavery is wrong, organizes an anti-slavery society in uh, in Alton, Illinois in 1837, and in response to that, he is silenced and ultimately murdered, as this image suggests. And in the wake of his murder, uh, the state and, the, in fact, the nation, the whole North, has really got to think about what the impact of slavery is in the North, which is a central 
aspect of my book, that slavery is not merely a problem between the North and South. It's a problem in the North that Northerners have to think about in various ways. One of them is, what free speech rights do Northerners have in speaking about slavery? If a man can be killed and if a press can be destroyed because the editor of the press wishes to say that slavery is wrong, is slavery somehow taking away our freedoms in the North? That's a slightly different issue than what the implications of slavery are for black people in the South. But it's very important to Northerners who think freedom means you get to speak freely. So after Lovejoy uh, is murdered, abolitionism actually grows in Illinois and throughout the North. Doesn't mean the anti-abolitionists uh, uh, quiet themselves down. In fact, they respond to the growth of abolitionism with additional anti-abolitionist violence. It's not really till the later 1840s that they stop you know, participating so strongly in this anti-abolitionist behavior. And in fact, the abolitionists, as they grow, try to effect political change by creating what's called the Liberty Party. It's not just an Illinois party, it's growing in the North more broadly. And that Liberty Party will politicize abolition where uh, the idea is, is to get the federal government to divorce itself from slavery, which is at the core of what Lincoln later will articulate for the Republicans, this idea that the nation is committed to anti-slavery, committed to freedom, and therefore anti-slavery policy should predominate. It's what I call an anti-slavery nationalism, and I say it's a way that Lincoln helps bring Northerners into a political coalition, a political movement that seems justified to them, that seems reasonably conservative or moderate, not something that's radical and fanatic like the abolitionists. So I think Lovejoy is very important because although he was someone who in 1837 is murdered for his beliefs, subsequently those uh, beliefs end up shaping Republican ideology in certain specific ways, not all of those ideas but certain key parts of them are very important. Well, the burr was under the saddle, and uh, I have behind me an original broadside uh, that was produced. This is an auction taking place in December of 1860. Lincoln was president-elect, and this was happening under him, that the land he was taking over was not only land for sale, but people were for sale. Uh, even though the typography of Negroes is kind of interesting, uh, I like the typography of that, but uh, not what it suggests. So this is what it was all about, and this is what was happening in the nation right at that time, hard to believe today. This book, we have not really covered everything in, uh, in this. It's a, it's a good read and an interesting read to get into all of this. We haven't really gotten into the economic aspects. We haven't gotten to the religious aspects and some of the other parties that were involved and getting further into uh, Douglas as well. So it's a book I think that uh, people are going to, in, going to learn from. And afterward, hey, I'm, I'm glad I read that book. Now coming up on Author's Voice, uh, which is connecting authors to the world, as we like to say. Some upcoming shows that you might want to know about. You, if you're on our website now, or if you're on YouTube, you can go to authorsvoice.net, and you can see a listing of what we have in the various genres of books and authors that we'll be having. Here are some of them coming up now. Uh, on our mystery show, Solved, November 15th at 3 p.m., uh, Jamie Frevoletti with Blood Run. Berta's books uh, is November 29th at 2 p.m. Donna Seaman with Identity Unknown, Rediscovering Seven American Women Artists. And Roberta in Berta's books is going to give you an interesting show. She knows a good deal about authors and good books to present to you. So I think this is a show you might want to really listen to. Our next House Divided is December 1st at noon. Uh, James Pula with Under the Crescent Moon, with the 11th Corps and the Civil War, Volume 1. So you don't want to miss that because if you get in with Volume 2, you won't know what was happening before. So get in at December 1st for the next House Divided. Lit with Love, a romance show, comes up December 5th at 2 p.m. Sally Kilpatrick will be here with Bless Her Heart. Then Stranger Than Fiction, December 8th at 3.30 p.m., this is an interesting book that's coming up. Gail Lukasik with White Like Her talks about how a, her mother, if I remember correctly, turned out to be a different race than she thought. And 
what came from that. Fascinating, true story in Stranger Than Fiction. And then again, Stranger Than Fiction, December 9th, the next day at noon, Joan Marie Johnson with Funding Feminism. I think you're going to like all of these. So if you're again on YouTube and watching this and want to get uh, any of our books that are signed first editions for your library, uh, please go on and you'll, you can buy any of them uh, while we still have them, of course. Uh, so go to authorsvoice.net. Well, I want to thank you so much, Graham, for thank being you. with us here and uh, for uh, SIU, for Illinois University Press, sorry, uh, for bringing you to us. Uh, we have a great association with the uh, University of Illinois Press, a long standing, and we appreciate their support by sending authors like you with interesting books to us. The staff of the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, of course, we could not have done this program or any of these without them. So thank you again. Come back, and we'll see you soon at Author's Voice. Music